Musicians in bars getting beer. It's Darby Mills. How you doing, Darby? I'm doing uh, good. Great, great. You want to start? You want to do that? No, that's okay. This is, this is my seventh interview today. And so. you've been on tour for how long now? This well, nice tour. on tour in my life these days means uh, you go out, do a show or two or three. If you're really lucky, then you go home, you have enough time to do your laundry, uh, feed your kid and your dogs and your fish, and then pack your bags and head back out again. You don't go out for months on end anymore. You go out for a couple of shows, get home, go back out, because, you know, WestJet needs your money. <laughs> That's who we're working for. They're, right? they're making more money, and WestJet's making more money off me this year than I'm making off WestJet, let's put it that way. <laughs> so you got a video that just came out. Yeah, uh, Monkey. We um, had the opportunity to pick through a few songs, um, and there was one, uh, Bad Bad Boy was one that got a uh, thumbs up from Steve Tyler from uh, Aerosmith. He thought it was a, a smash hit, but we ran out of daylight or should I say warm weather in Vancouver. So I went, in, in lieu of not being able to do Bad Bad Boy, which Steve Tyler thought was a hit. Uh, did I say that? Did I say Steve <laughs> Tyler thought was a hit? Um, uh, knowing this is an, a, a new shot at uh, coming back out after all these years of being a singer for a different a, another band, um, if I only got one kick at the can, if I only got one opportunity to bring a song to light, I decided that I would do a, um, a song called Monkey, and it's an environmental song. And even though the song was written 26 years ago and recorded 26 years ago, because this whole album, Flying Solo, is a re release of the Never Look Back CD, which was recorded after I got fired from the Headpins in '85. And yeah, I got fired. And um, I had a chance to go back and listen to the songs about four or five years ago and realized the album never. The CD never got a, real, a chance to really kick in, and what I have learned over the past few years working with late greats, um, Nazareth to be exact, um, they've put out a couple new CDs in the time, the last 15 years basically, I've had an opportunity to work with them every summer. And one particular summer I had a bunch of my high school buddies come out and uh, we used to party in the bushes to Nazareth this flight tonight and Razamanaz so that was that where, was where was this uh, in Kamloops um, I graduated home, in Kamloops right? Vernon's home but I grad I spent six years in school in Kamloops and and that's when I was drinking and partying in in the bushes out in the woods and uh, so I'd invited all my old friends we were, we were playing uh, Sturgis North the very first Sturgis North and uh, all my old buds that I used to you know throw up in the woods with it's like come and see Nazareth come and see them so there we were we we opened the show they were closing we were out I was out in the audience with all my buds and we're like ah here they come here they come it's gonna be great it's gonna be great it's gonna be great it's gonna be great and it's like what the hell I don't know any of these songs and it's like oh, they're playing all their new stuff. new stuff they changed their set like and no disrespect but those aren't the songs my friends came to hear. You wanted to hear Hair of the Dog. I wanted to hear Son of a Bitch, and yeah. I wanted to hear those songs that I partied to yeah. that were the fabric of my youth. Sure. So right then and there, I went, light people of our era are not coming to see my new material, Nazareth new material, or anybody else's new material. They're coming to relive those days that are so far gone, to smile again. So. Uh, that's when I trip and stumbled back into the rights of the Never Look Back CD and I had been trying to do some new solo stuff, new writing and getting musicians to come into the studio for spec and I'll pay you later, uh, you know, book studio time, having musicians not show up. It was just like, you know what, this is, why am I trying to get perfect? And why am I trying to do new material when people really don't want to hear new material? They want to go back, they want to hear what they know, what's, what's, so um, I just said, why well, try to be perfect when you can have good? I re-listened to really? Never Look Back and went, the songs and the lyrics and the playing that were done by the best session players I could hire in Vancouver in, uh, Vancouver in, in 99, or 1990, um, why don't I just remaster it, add some of the bottom end subsonics to it. I threw on House and Pooh Corner as an a cappella tune. It was supposed to have harmonies and all that. But the last Sky Train was in 25 minutes. I didn't have time to put har harmonies on it. So there's the saying, 
why bother being perfect when you can be good? So uh, we just, I just dealt with it, said this is as good as it's going to get. And out of that came Monkey, a great environmental song that the people hopefully will still feel or feel connected with. Absolutely. You were touring with Aerosmith at some point back then. No, uh, I think we did one show with Aerosmith sometime in the past 36 so years. So how did she finally get a hold of this? Uh, the, the first video I shot for this, uh, for Monkey, will never come out. It was, it was done on spec and uh, it will never come out. Spec doesn't work. Free doesn't work. <laughs> Pay for it yourself. Invest in yourself. Why would anybody else invest in, in you if you can't invest in yourself? So uh, when that video was shot, green screen, it was going to be fantastic. It was yeah. fantastic. It will just never come out because financially, um, I don't know, talk to the guy that it'll never come out with. But anyway, <laughs> uh, he is a, a relatively uh, established cameraman and he went down to Nashville and filmed was one of the cameramen on Steven Tyler's oh. country single and it was about two years ago that Steven Tyler attempted to go country and he played uh, Monkey and uh, Bad Bad Boy to Steven Tyler and Steven Tyler thought Bad Bad Boy was a hit so one day we'll see if I, if I make any money on the road this summer <laughs> um, you never know. Maybe I'll maybe I'll pay for another another single, and Bad Bad Boy will be it. What happened with the Walk of Fame? I ha you know what I didn't even know I was nominated. It came to me via a friend of a friend of a friend. Uh, at the time, Facebook really wasn't I wasn't part of my life at the time, so I didn't hear about it through Facebook. Uh, some st a stranger walked up to me one day and said, "Congratulations!" And I'm like, "Okay." I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> and they said, "Well, you got nominated to have a star on the Walk of Fame." And I'm like, "You're nuts! I'm nothing about it." And they're like, "Yeah." And then in the last uh, two years, it's come up in a couple interviews. Other people researching and found out that it was actually fact. Uh, they never told me. I was never informed. I, I didn't know. So I kind of missed that celebration. But it's all good, you know. Yay, Canada's <laughs> Walk of Fame. It's getting bigger. Uh, kind of almost was there. Yay. I think you're going to be there soon. Well, you know, but there's many, many people like Kenny Shields who should have been there before he passed. Say no more. Okay. Who else do you want to thank when you win the Grammy? When I win the Grammy, well, I'll probably come back as uh, Rihanna. And then I'll win the Grammy as Rihanna. Um, <laughs> In another life. Uh, you know what? My husband, um, who's been, who was Mr. Mom for all those years, I was out with the headpins, uh, making ends meet barely. Uh, it's a rough game, you know. Unless you're at the top, you don't make any money doing this. It costs you as much to play as it does to get paid. Uh, it's a, it's a product of love and desire to entertain. And Sounds like you're quite an independent woman. It was the biggest fight I've been in my life to walk away from 36 years of uh, being told this is how it's going to be. And I just got, I got tired of being told how it was going to be. And uh, I told this story so many times in the last uh, year, three years ago, after basically becoming a caregiver to my mom and dad who were 80, mid-80s. They couldn't look after themselves anymore. We moved them to Vernon, where I'm from, and moved back to 30 some odd years ago. Um, my mom passed away suddenly, and six months later, my husband had a heart attack basically in our driveway, sitting in the ambulance on a gurney. He flatlined. They took 15 minutes and 10 broken ribs to bring him back to life. And at that point, I was. Um, another light went on going, what are you doing? You know, to, uh, tomorrow I could be gone. Tomorrow we can all be gone. I don't want to cross the finish line going, I shoulda, coulda, woulda. Um, so I said goodbye to what I've been doing for my whole adult life. I joined the Headpins when I was just over 20. And last year I was 57. And I walked away because it was not satisfying everything that I thought I had to give. And the boys were comfortable doing what we'd been doing for all that time. And, um, you know, there was a few other things that I won't get into, but it just wasn't making sense anymore. So I walked away. You're a 
heroine of Canada and of the world, of the rock world. Um, any uh, Taekwondo and dotes? Ah, um, don't fight with somebody who knows how to do Taekwondo or any <laughs> kind of martial arts. That's bad. Um, if you kick too hard to the wrong spot, you break your toe. If you land incorrectly, you break your ankle. I did do three weeks on tour with a non-weight-bearing cast, a bright pink one. Some of you might have seen those shows. And uh, you know what? It's a discipline, and it's kept me fit. I ended up being a teacher for nine years. I've been gone for three. Probably couldn't take anybody out with any skill, but I could probably take a drunk a drunk male of 140 under pounds. I could probably take, take you out. So, you, know. you don't know the neck pinch thing? The neck pinch and well, a good bite, a good bite on the nose will do that for you too, right? But no, it's all, uh, yeah, that was another reinvention, uh, getting my black belt and turning into a teacher. I didn't expect to be doing that, but filled my children. Both my kids have black belts, and uh, now mom does too. And uh, you know, you don't use it, you lose it. Yeah. You've told some moving stories already. Do you have any uh, funny stories from the road? Any uh, Funny favorite place to play, something like that? Some place uh, that knocked you out? Uh, ripping the crotch of my pants out at a family show with brand new pleather pants. <laughs> um, because they were low riders, which I didn't normally wear. It took me two years to try and bring my stomach into a position where I felt comfortable wearing them on stage. <laughs> So after hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of sit-ups, I had enough courage to wear them on stage and five minute call comes and I'm like, you know, I've never worn these on stage before. I should probably wear my full length black sweater over top of these black plastic leather pants just in case something happens. Stage was about six feet, mm, four, five and a half feet tall. People could just barely see. So they were looking straight up at us, cameras. Ladies and gentlemen, the head pins. Kaka! Oh, fuck. Mm. Ripped the crotch on the first note from the knot at the center right up to the belt straps on the back. And I, before I put the black sweater on at the five minute stage call, I was wearing black t-bar underwear that I thought you know it's a family <laughs> show if I do bend over it's kind of gross to have the little ones seeing a black no. t-bar so I took it off <laughs> so I was literally commando. commando but thank goodness I put that sweater on but I have to wear that sweater normally which comes off after the first song I had to wear that sweater for the whole show and um I mooned the boys when we got off stage. We, we, we walked into the dressing room. I'm like, so this is what I've been wearing all, all set. And they're like, oh, my God. Like, literally, the, the, the crack <laughs> was that big. So I have since, it's the only time I've killed an animal to wear it. The rest of the time, it's all Value Village secondhand leather, <laughs> if I wear leather. But I have since, because I worked so hard to get into those, pardon me, fucking leather pants, uh, I did go out and... and uh, purchase a, a cow hide and had real leather pants made so that hopefully that will never happen again. I'm not wearing them this evening at the show. Uh, it's only special events that I will wear that to. But yeah, that was uh, that was a show that will go down in the annals of history. <laughs> yes. Blah. Pardon the pun. Yes. That was great. Snoopy's here. Musicians that's that's my call. Getting beer. That's my call to uh, call my dad and make sure my dad's okay. So... Thank Love you for being on my Take show. Care. Oh my God, that was so moving. All right. Cheers. Well, thank you so much.